All right. Well, hi everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, coming and listening to me today. Uh, I'm going to speak about the Cosmos DB with you today. Uh, before we start, can I actually maybe use the this hand feature here? Can you actually show me how many of you actually using the Cosmos DB currently? Right. So it looks like we have a couple of uh, current users. So that's great. Uh, usually I just ask, so I will kind of uh, see, you know, what's the uh, level uh, everybody. Is it going to be like a more, it's going to be a new uh, for you or not? So thanks for answering it. Uh, yeah, today I'm going to try to explain you how the Azure Cosmos TV works uh, under the hood. I'm going to try to, uh, you know, uh, show you how actually it handles the data and what you should know to make it uh, work better. So that's going to be the main idea for today. So before I go and jump into the presentation, let me speak about myself a little bit. Uh, my name is Hassan Savran, and I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, currently, I'm a business intelligence manager at Progressive Insurance, and I have been MVP for two years now. Uh, I have good experience with the web development for 15 years, and it's almost eight years now. I have been in business intelligence uh, department, so I had a chance to kind of work with data, SQL Server, Cosmos TV, with all kind of uh, products. And you can follow me in any of those platforms you see here. I will be happy to answer any of your questions in the session, or if you will have any other questions later, you can ask me from any of those uh, you know, uh, places. I try to write in my blog at least once or twice a month, and I usually write about SQL Server, Cosmos DB, front end, C Sharp, whatever, you know, really I know I like to share out there. So check it out. You might find something interesting out there. And with that, let's actually start the presentation. So uh, I started the history of Cosmos TV, and probably you see this uh, graph many times if you actually look at the Cosmos TV. In 2010, the Cosmos TV uh, project started as a project Florence. And that was almost like an internal project for uh, Microsoft because they needed a solution uh, for this OLTP problems they were having. Uh, especially with their bigger uh, applications, like they have, for example, Skype, they have Xbox, and they have Office. All of those are global applications, and they share a lot of data, and they have users from you know globally everywhere. So they needed some kind of solution because relational databases were not cutting them. So they started this project named Florence in 2010. Uh, in five years, they had great uh, experience with this and they were using it. So it was almost time to kind of make this available to public. So, you know, they are using it in the, on top of that, they can make money, right? So in 2015, they actually released Cosmos DB and the name was Document DB then. That was the place for any devs to store uh, NoSQL data in cloud and they were able to actually retrieve the data back uh, with as a language similar to T-SQL. So it was pretty popular and, you know, devs didn't really need to learn a whole new language to actually get the data back to. And they were able to use, you know, C-sharp to save the data. So everybody was happy. Uh, Microsoft did not stop working on that. They, you know, develop uh, many new features after 2015. Uh, one of the big ones, so in 2017, uh, they changed the name from Document DB to Cosmos DB. And also they add a bunch of new features like global distribution, multi-model. And after that, you know what happened, COVID came. But really Cosmos DB team did not stop. They still uh, gave some amazing features. Now we have the serverless, uh, we have the scale for the Cosmos DB. And actually, they just released the continuous backup with a uh, point in time restore. So you can actually get the uh, restore yourself rather than depending on their uh, you know, team. They just released a role based access security. I think MongoDB 4 is coming up, or it might be already there. So there are some amazing features still coming up for Cosmos DB. So the first question usually I get uh, for Cosmos DB is who is using this? 
So usually I just put them in the three categories. The first one is, I will say, probably the games. For example, Minecraft Earth is actually using Cosmos DB in the backend. The games are, you know, like everything else, games are different too. In my old days, we used to buy the game. Sometimes it's on the disc, sometimes on CD. You pay, I don't know, $40, $50 and you own the game. That's it, right? But now you are buying the game. If it's a, like a racing game, they still try to sell you new cars so you're, you can go faster. Or if you are playing like a soccer or anything like that, they try to sell you, I guess, better players or whatever like that. So the games are still kind of like almost like a, this e-commerce system. So you can still buy stuff. And also, you know, it's a global, you are online and playing with many people. So you kind of need some kind of database because, you know, in whenever in, in the top of the game, you shows you like who is the top 10 players, for example. So in some kind of database to actually store all this data. And Cosmos DB is great for that because it's on cloud, it's available globally, and you can really do those very easily in Cosmos DB. And also it's no SQL, so there's no schema. Uh, it's much easier to save the data, especially game, games like that. Uh, second one is the e-commerce. E-commerce is, well, you need a system, you are trying to sell stuff, right? For example, if you think about Amazon out there, you know, there are some special days that you have many users comes and try to use your system like Black Friday. So in those days, you need to kind of have a database which can, you know, uh, serve as many users as it can, like in Black Friday, for example. So scaling up is great, but you should be able to scale down too in the same time. So Cosmos TV actually fits in that perfectly. Uh, third one is IoT devices. IoT devices kind of going crazy lately. So there's almost like more than 50 billion actually devices, IoT devices on Earth. And those things are just like creating data constantly. And you need a system for that, you know, which is going to handle all this uh, IoT devices. And it has to be always, always online, so you won't lose any data. So Cosmos TV is great for that because on top of this, a NoSQL database. So any kind of device, they have different schemas, so you can save them out there. But in the meantime, after you actually go and save the, you know, your data from the IoT device to the Cosmos DB, you can actually create a lot of other pipelines from Cosmos DB to other, you know, features of Azure. So that's it. that gives, you know, a great platform for you. You can save the data and you can move from there and use, you can analyze the data and you can actually try and maybe do something about the data you are receiving from the IoT devices. Next question I get usually is, well, why do we need another database system? Don't we have enough out there? That's a good question too. So in here, uh, actually you are seeing uh, those numbers, what happens on internet in one day. For example, we are sending 500 million tweets. Who thinks that actually Twitter using SQL Server for that? The requirements and the data is changing constantly and it's getting larger and larger. So it's pretty clear that relational database is not going to able to cut, you know, any of those uh, numbers. Uh, on top of that, you know, IBM came up this uh, research. I think it was three or four years ago, and from that time and uh, two years prior to that, they find out that we actually generate 90% of the data in the world in two years, which is a crazy number. And, you know, I think the numbers in the right side kind of explains that why. And we have actual situations like this, right? You know, in older days, we were not creating this much data. In these days, that's not the issue. You know, we have pictures, we have videos, we have all kind of data. And on top of that, we have to analyze these pictures and videos sometimes. So we need a different database system to actually handle all this data. Also. Our device types, there are many device types now, rather than, you know, in older days, we had the desktop application or the desktop computer. Now we have all kinds of device types. And depending on the device type, your application might work a little bit different or actually create more data. For example, if you are if you have a GPS chip, maybe you want to actually track the user, right? So that means your application is going to actually create more data. Your customers are expecting much more now because, you know, in older days, I remember in the special in enterprise, we just have all those gray 
grids right now. It's very simple. So that's not the case anymore. You know, your customers are actually expecting more because everybody has Twitter account, everybody has Facebook account, everybody is using those fancy tools. And that's that's what the expect expectation is from the actual front end and you know from any developers right now. Uh, also, applications you know consume more data and generate more data than before. Globalization is another issue. Uh, so internet actually makes it very easy if you create you know one application. It can be a very simple application, and but you might be solving a problem like everybody's had, right? right? So you just put that on one of the stores. You can put it on the I don't know Windows Store or the Apple Store, whatever. Next day when you wake up, you might see actually have users from all over the world. Hopefully you pick the right database because usually databases are where actually the bottleneck is of the uh, solutions. So globalization is a good thing, but it can be a bad thing if you pick wrong uh, infrastructure for your system. So explain how the Cosmos TV actually works. I'm going to give you one kind of example that I just uh, I just made up here. So what I'm going to actually talk about here is let's say we own a a car company, right? We are building cars and we are located somewhere in Europe. Uh, what's happening lately is all the cars are getting smarter and smarter. Some of them is actually driving themselves and we feel like, you know what, we should just jump in in that and maybe make one of our models smarter. So what we are going to do here is we are going to put a couple of IoT devices in our car and we are going to able to, you know, get some data from the car and maybe even push some data back to the car. So we will have happy customers. That's the idea. So we hired a dev, uh, you know, uh, dev developers to develop this. And they start to look at our requirements. And the first thing came up is what kind of database we are going to need for this. It's pretty clear that it's not going to be a relational database because, you know, it's depending which IoT device is creating the data, schema might be different. Well, this year we have one model, maybe next year we have 10 models. So we are going to need a NoSQL database. So our devs actually goes and picks Cosmos TV and give it a you know chance. So Cosmos TV, if you have a new solution, just like the way that I'm explaining, you are starting from scratch. Microsoft uh, actually suggests you to start your application uh, with SQL API. Uh, Cosmos DB has multiple APIs, which I will cover in a little bit, but SQL API is developed by Microsoft. You can use MongoDB, you can use Cassandra, you can use anything else, but SQL API is probably the most uh, complex one uh, if you know if you compare others. And Microsoft actually you know uh, has the rights to change anything on it. So if you're going to need something in feature, and if you're going to you know try to maybe get from Microsoft, you might have a chance because Microsoft actually has the rights to change that. Now, uh, our dev team actually fires up the Cosmos TV in the dev environment, uh, and they say, okay, let's give it, give it a try. As soon as actually it comes up online, our SLA is 99.99%, which is a great start. The next thing our dev team does is, OK, so where's our customers? And where are we selling this stuff? Where the data is going to come from and where is it going to go? And right now we are in Europe. And they find out that actually we have users all over the world. But most of the places we are selling this car is in the United States, Central Europe and East of Asia. So now it kind of makes things a little bit more, I guess, difficult for their team because right now our database in the Central Europe, and we really don't want people from United States or Asia and try to write the data to Europe because, well, there's a long distance out there. It's going to take longer for them to reach the uh, database and all many things can go wrong out there and it can be slow. So our dev team goes back to Cosmos DB and they figure out that guess what? Cosmos DB actually has global distribution, which means I can actually pick other data centers close to my users and make my database available in those areas. So in our case, our dev team is going to actually go and pick one data center in the east side of the United States, one in the west side. We already have one in Europe and we are going to pick one in Asia. 
uh, as soon as we are going to go and click uh, update, since we don't really have that much data right now, since we are in dev, less than 30 minutes, our database will be available in if all of those places that we just picked. So if a user, let's say in Los Angeles, try to write the data, actually the application and SDK of the Cosmos DB is smart enough to pick the right database closer to the user. So it's going to pick the West to write data and read data. Also, since the database is available in multiple areas, our SLA actually is much higher now. It's almost 100%. It's 99.999% SLA, which is a great number. What else do we know when we say the data? What where actual data are called? Because if you think about the older days in SQL Server, it used to come with you know the CD. You put the CD in, and you kind of can customize everything about the SQL Server. You know where it's located. You know where the files are. But in Cosmos TV, all you did is just create an account and create a database. You don't really know where your data is or what's really happening in backend. So the first thing we know is. The data is actually is stored locally in SSD drives. We know that. Also, what else we know is depending how much data you are going to have, uh, your data is going to actually stay in physical partitions. And each physical partition is going to be actually uh, available in every data center. And if we actually go in and look at that physical partition a little bit more closer, you are going to actually see a replica set inside the physical partition. So you have four copies of your database in one physical partition. We have one leader and three followers. When it comes to the physical partition, you really don't have that much control. Microsoft controls that 100%. So you cannot really change anything in here. But you need to know two numbers when it comes to the physical partition. The first one is 50 gig. That means that physical partition cannot be larger than 50 gig. If you are going to have 60 gig, for example, you are going to, that means you're going to have two physical partitions. So when you get close to the 50 gig, I don't think it waits until it goes to 100%. I will say if it reaches like 80 to 90%, I think the second phys physical partition will be fired up. And what's going to happen here is one of them is going to be full, the second one is going to be empty. And Cosmos DB is going to try to balance them and start to move some of the data from first one to the other one. So the first thing you need to know is 50 gig is the limit. Second one is 10,000 request units. Request units is the way that you actually uh, well, pay really to Cosmos DB. It gives you 10,000 request units per second. That is the limit of a one physical partition. So for whatever reason, for reason your application is going to need maybe let's say 15,000 request units, even this physical partition is not full, like 50 gig, you are going to end up with two physical partitions. So whenever you need to scale up and scale down, you should know and remember those two numbers because those are going to actually make the physical partitions uh, you know, go up or down. As you can see, this uh, one is uh, without global distribution. In our case, we have global distribution. So when uh, we have the global distribution, this model changes a little bit. Uh, in the with global distribution, actually you can see we have one Europe, one east of the United States and one in Asia. As you can see, one of the followers actually changes to a forward. So what happens here is that data actually comes in to any of the leaders. Let's say in our case, it's the Europe. Then leader actually transmit the data to followers and the forwarder. And the forwarder's job is take this data and send it to other leaders. So in our case, it just sends the United States East and Asia. So that's why or that's how actually Cosmos DB syncs the data in the back end. At the end, you have the same data in all of the locations. Usually this is the place that I get the question, what about conflicts? What if maybe one person in Europe tried to write the data, which Asia, there's another person tried to write the same data. What happens? Well, conflict happens. Doesn't matter which database you are talking about, it happens. And when that happens, uh, the Cosmos TV 
we have a one referee actually comes up and stops the, trans the transactions. It can be an insert conflict, it can be a replaced conflict, or it can be a delayed uh, conflict. If you don't change anything, uh, the default rule is going to be last write wins. So whoever write it, you know, last, we will take that data and throw the other one, which sounds easy, but it doesn't really apply to everybody, right? It's not that easy. So sometimes you really have to look at the data and kind of compare them and try to figure out which one you should trust. In that case, you are going to pick custom. When you pick the custom, uh, you need to actually create a store procedure. And you can put all that business logic, which is going to compare this uh, data in that uh, store procedure. So what's going to happen here is our referee is going to stop the transaction. Your conflict transaction is going at queue. And we are going to have the store procedure. We are going to run for each item in that queue and try to solve the problem one by one like that. So you have two options, last right wins or the custom. And it comes to the storage. Uh, I think it was last year. Uh, Cosmos DB came up with a different uh, storage system. So the first storage system is coming from any of the API. So it doesn't matter which API you pick, your data is going to go in the transactional store and your data is going to get uh, saved as row by row. So it's going to be a row store. So if you look at the uh, bottom of the screen here, as you can see, all the data is getting saved by row by row here. So it's much easier to find for usually you have the, you know, looking for maybe like a number. As long as you find a primary key, you reach all the data right here. So it's much easier for transactional data. But if you try to analyze this data, or if you try to, you know, use any of the aggregation functions, it's not going to be that easy because you might be looking, I don't know, let's say the product code that might be, for example, age, and you want to try to maybe find average age, then, you know, they are not going to be close to each other. Uh, because of that, Cosmos DB actually created a new storage uh, system named Analytical Store. Uh, this is not uh, enabled by default, so you have to en en enable it first of all if you want to use that. So what happens here is uh, our data goes in the transactional store, and if you enable the analytical store, uh, Cosmos DB actually takes that data, whatever is inserted, updated, or deleted, and moves to the analytical store for you. It's almost like really that ETL that you write, you know, you have tried to move data from OLTP to reporting, right? But actually Cosmos DB does that for you. And also this is in column store. So as you can see, everything is saved column by column. So if I want to find, for example, age of a product, all the ages are going to be in the same area. So it's going to be much easier to find the average of a number. As I said before, that gives us great uh, you know, architecture. It gives an isolation between the transactional and local environments, which is great. And this storage is globally distributed, just like the other storage. Uh, you don't have to worry about ETLs. Nobody likes ETLs. They break and you have to go and fix them. And, you know, it doesn't matter how good you are in the code. It might be a network issue. It can be something that you have no control about. So whenever it fails, usually it's pain to kind of find and fix a problem. So in this case, Cosmos DB handles that for you. And depending how much data you have, uh, Cosmos DB actually guarantees that this data will be available in the analytical storage two to five minutes. In my experience, I don't have that large data. Usually I will say really less than 30 seconds, the data is there. So that almost give you like a real time reporting environment if you, you, know, if you are writing reporting uh, to get from analytical storage. And those are the prices uh, of the analytical storage. It's much cheaper. And uh, most of the reason it's cheaper is it's not the local SSD anymore. And they, to save actually money, uh, they are doing the local SSD just like the transactional storage. If we compare uh, transactional storage and logical storage, which we are going to cover the logical partitions a little bit, but in transactional storage, you have a limit for each logical partition, which is the 20 gig. In analytical storage, you don't have that. Uh, everything is uh, the way that you know we say the data is different. One is the row oriented, the other one is column oriented. 
Uh, the only way you can pull the data from analytical storage is the SNAPS uh, analytics. So that you kind of have to use that uh, to get the data from there. Uh, both of them has this great feature, time to leave. And time to leave is actually you can say, for example, for retention, maybe you don't care about your uh, data after two years. So you can actually make it two years default time to leave in transactional and data will be deleted automatically and you won't pay any money for them to actually do that either. So it's free. So you don't need to worry about the retention uh, or write a kind of ETL job, which will find all their data to delete it. In the same time, you have the same one for analytical storage. So you might have, you might say that, you know what, after two years, I don't care in transactional, but you might still need to kind of need it for, you know, uh, analyze the data. So you might have two years here and you might have five years here. Uh, Cosmos DB uh, handles that both for you. And as I said before, uh, transactional storage, uh, it uses a local SSD and here is off class SSD to actually keep the price lower. Now, uh, if you look at the Cosmos TV overly on paper, we have, after you create the, the service, Cosmos TV service, you are going to create a database. Your database, the first thing you kind of need to, I guess, answer what type of API you are going to use. As I said before, SQL API, I will suggest that if you are starting from uh, scratch, a new project. But if you have a MongoDB and if you want to actually go back to Cosmos DB, you can pick MongoDB or Cassandra. If you have database and any of those, you can just pick them and move your data to Cosmos DB. Your application, the API, which actually uses your MongoDB database, is going to think that actually is uh, going to MongoDB when it's reaching the Cosmos DB. It's not going to know anything. And usually, I would say 98, 99%, you don't need to change any line of code. And it's win to win kind of situation. After that, uh, you are going to have each container is going to have store procedures. It's going to have user defined functions, triggers, all are each are for each container. So the first thing you need to know, for example, the store procedures, they are in JavaScript. So that's kind of like a very surprising thing, special for DBAs. You know, everybody's uh, know T-SQL and everybody likes to, you know, use that in store procedures. That's not the case in Cosmos DB. So you need to know JavaScript to write store procedures or user-defined functions. Also, uh, store procedures actually runs only if you remember that replica set I show you, you had a reader and you had three followers. Store procedures runs executed only in the reader, which means that if you try to read something uh, in your by using the store procedures, you are kind of less think leaders time because leaders always getting the updates, inserts and deletes, and it's pretty busy uh, node. You don't want to read data in leader. You want to write data in leader. So if you want to use the store procedures, just be sure that whatever you are doing, you are just inserting, updating, deleting data. You don't want to uh, read data by store procedures. If you want to really uh, read the data, then you can actually use user-defined functions. This is JavaScript too. Uh, the biggest difference is user-defined functions actually in runs in the followers. So those are good for reading data. So I will suggest that if you are trying to use a store procedure uh, to read data, try to put them in the user-defined functions. We have triggers, uh, just like SQL Server. The biggest difference is they don't get uh, executed automatically. They don't get fired automatically. So you have to actually fire them manually by using the SDK. You have two types of triggers, pre-transaction and post-transaction. We have the merge procedures. Those are the ones that I just talked about whenever a conflict happens. So you create the store procedure to which is going to merge the data uh, when conflict happens and you uh, register as merge procedure. And conflicts, uh, we just covered that. Uh, each container has items. So items kind of changes depending which API you pick, uh, especially if you are using the REST API of Cosmos DB. For example, if you pick the SQL API, your data is going to get called documents. If you are going to pick uh, Gremlin, your data is going to be nodes and edges. If you're going to pick table API, your data is going to be rows. So 
this is usually, especially if you're using the REST API, the URL you are going to use is going to be different for each API, so the name is going to be different. Uh, every document, every collection, every database actually has uh, special properties, and they apply to each level here. For example, uh, this is a document here. You are seeing that uh, all of those columns are actually, or the nodes, uh, are in each document in Cosmos DB. For example, first one is the RID. This is the record ID, as you can see here. Uh, the second one is the ETAG, which I'm going to cover in a little bit. It's mostly for optimistic concurrency, and we will cover that in a little bit. This is the timestamp. It gives you the last updated timestamp. As you can see, is in Unix uh, time format. Uh, underscore self is really important, especially if you are using the REST API, and that gives you the pinpoint to the document. In our case, if you look at it, it starts with DBS. This is a DBS RID. This defines which database you are trying to reach. After that, collections comes up, and that's the collections underscore RID, which tells us which collection this is. And then we have documents, and that's the documents RID, which you can see it matches perfectly with this one. So this one actually tells us pinpoint where this uh, data is. And also we have ID. ID is the only one you can overwrite. So for example, we might have a, a container, let's say orders, and you have an order ID. Maybe you want to make this ID and you know say that order ID is going to be this ID. You can do that. Then you are creating the data. The rest of them uh, is automatically getting changed, and it's not really uh, recommended to use them that much because they might change. And they are almost like that's virtual columns if you compare the SQL Server. Now, uh, I say that we are going to cover this ETEC. So next one is going to actually do that. So uh, this is uh, ETEC is mostly for the Let's actually put the definition here. Optimistic concurrency. What is optimistic concurrency? So if you are, for example, talking about SQL Server, let's say we have a website and we have a couple of admins and they maybe update some items. So let's say they need to update one item and they open it in the same time. They don't know they open it in the same time. So we have two users looking at the same data. Well, one of them is going to be faster than the other one, and we know that one of them is going to change the data, and second one is not going to see that because he thinks that you know nobody's working on it. The first the, uh, user is going to save the data, and when second one is trying to save the data, what happens in SQL Server is really depending on the dev, right? So if the dev uh, writes, the, I guess, the logic uh, better, What's going to happen here is usually that's how uh, actual devs handle this. We had this updated date and update time column in the databases. So whenever you try to actually show this data in the UI, uh, usually devs get these columns and hides them on the form that actually in the browser. So whenever you click the submit, uh, we actually post that data back to SQL Server. So before you actually update the data, you kind of devs actually compare if the updated date and update maybe by is changed or not. If it's changed, then that means somebody actually changed this data. You might need to go back to UI and say that, you know what, the data is changed or you just refresh the page and maybe click submit again. All this logic I just tell you is really on devs shoulder. SQL Server doesn't care. Uh, you can update as many as you want. SQL Server is not going to care. In Cosmos DB, all that logic I just explained actually can be handled by Cosmos DB. And that ETEC that I just showed you, if you look at here, uh, this is the text. It changes every time this gets updated. Uh, so what's going to happen in our case is you can use one of those excess conditions. The most common one is the if match. For the if match, you are going to actually take this text and pass it with if match. If it's going to match, then Cosmos DB is going to accept this data and save it. If it's not going to match, then Cosmos DB is the one which is going to throw the error, not the dev, dev's logic. 
So that's most common one. Uh, you can use if none match. This is mostly for catching the data whenever you are getting the data. And if modified by since, you can use actually a date here. So you can actually search or, or the, put a logic here by uh, if modified since if you like. But most common one is the if match. All right, uh, next one. In here, I'm just really showing you all the compliance uh, list of Cosmos TV. This is mostly for reference. I don't really have that much to say here. Uh, depending what uh, business you are in, you might be actually looking some of those certifications. I don't know, like for, for example, HIPAA is here if you are in uh, healthcare. So this is just for the reference. Next big thing uh, in Cosmos TV is partitioning. Uh, partitioning is very important uh, because that's going to be your first curve. And you better take it right because it's going to affect the rest of the rates. So a lot of things can go right, wrong here. And usually when I talk about the partitioning, uh, if I have, you know, SQL DBAs, I get questions like, oh yeah, is it working like primary key? It makes it kind of unique in uh, tables. Uh, the answer is no, it doesn't work like primary key. What about a table partitioning? Similar, but it's not all the way the same. So there are a lot of things can go wrong with partitioning. For example, you might have hot partition problems. As I said before, logical partitions has limit of 20 gig. That means if it's going to be larger than 20 gig, you need to change your partition. The worst part is you cannot repartition Cosmos DB. You have to actually create a whole different table with different partition ID and move data from one to the other one. You cannot repartition data or the tables in Cosmos DB. Uh, so let's try to actually look at this a little bit more deeper because partitioning is very important. So look at this garage, for example. It's really organized, right? So if I'm going to ask you, well, can, I, can you go get me a screwdriver? You don't really need to know anything about this uh, garage. You know exactly where the screwdrivers are, and it, will take, it won't take that much time for you to go find it and get it. It doesn't have to be yours. Look at this closet. I wish my closet was like that. If I'm going to ask you, like, get me the red shoes, it's right in front of you. You know exactly where the shoes are. It's going to go. You're going to go. You're going to actually complete this really fast, this task. This is my, uh, I guess, the favorite one. Uh, when I started the computers, I was in this uh, computer service. I used to work in the third party shift. And sometimes I used to get, you know, IT calls and they were going to say that, oh, you know what, I cannot log into this computer. Can you go to the data center and just look at it? And if you cannot log in, can you just reset them so I can, you know, connect it? Sounds easy if you have a data center like that. But my data center wasn't like that. Uh, this job that they're asking me probably should take five, ten seconds if I know where the computer is. But if it's all over the place, sometimes it took 20, 30 minutes just to find the computer so I can actually press that uh, reset button. So the partitioning is kind of working the same way because when we actually try to create the data models or the data tables, do we really need to worry how this data is going to get, I guess, group and structure on the disk? Not in SQL Server. What actually happens in SQL Server is usually, uh, you know, the devs, Trace the data models, and you know, hopefully you have a primary key in them, and then you know you put them in production. There's no data in it, so everything is working fast. So what happens? Maybe six months later, you see project manager comes to you know to DBAs, and they say that you know what everything was working great, but everything is you know slowing down uh, every day. What's happening? So usually DBA goes and looks at the data models and schemas and figure out that, you know what, maybe it's missing a couple of indexes. So he throws the indexes on the tables and everything goes back to normal. Everything is working fast. Everything is great. But then maybe two years later, our project manager comes back and says, hey, you know what, everything was working fine. You put the indexes out there and now everything is slowing down. Can you go check it out? So DBA actually goes and usually uh, he or she figures out that there's too much data. Now I think it's a good time to actually partition your data. So that is usually the workflow in SQL Server. So you kind of wait for a problem to happen and do something about it, especially with the partitioning. 
In Cosmos DB, that's not the case. Cosmos DB asks you to actually, what is your partition key in the beginning? You have to give a partition key to start actually a container. Without that, you cannot create a container. So you really need to know uh, your data and you want to be sure that whatever you're going to fit partition key is going to be balanced for each partitions. And partition ID is going to be very important because it's going to distribute all the requests coming from the applications. It's going to distribute the storage and it's intelligently root queries for efficiency. So it's very important and that's the first curve you are going to take whenever you are creating the container. Uh, so you really need to pick the right one because just take your time, look at your where clauses, how you are going to get this data, and pick pick a good one. Now that was a logical partition. Uh, if we go back to physical partition, this was the example I gave you. So each physical partition, we were kind of showing them as the Lego blocks. So I want to change that uh, idea a little bit. So rather than uh, Lego blocks, let's Think them as a container ship. Uh, you create a Cosmos database, Cosmos DB database, and Cosmos DB is giving you this empty container ship and says that, you know what, uh, the capacity of this container ship is 50 gig. If you are going to need more, I will give you more container ships uh, if you will have more. And also, your max horsepower is going to be 10,000 request units for this uh, ship. So, those are the two numbers. Don't forget that. So, that's the physical partition. And there's not that much you can do about this physical partition or the container ship here because Cosmos DB owns it. What is you are responsible is how you are going to actually organize your storage on that container ship. That's your job. And you need to, you know, each of those containers here you see is really the your partitions. And Cosmos DB likes partitions small. Uh, the main reason is they are, if they are small, they are much easier to move from one container ship to other container ship. As I said before, when you end up with maybe the second physical partition, Cosmos TV is going to move them in the back end to the other one to balance the partitions. So if they are small, it's much more easy to scale and it's much easier to kind of move uh, this data uh, containers. Also, in our case, we were trying to create a web application for a not a web application, IoT application for a car. So really, if we actually try to think what we should pick as a partition key for that, you can, I mean, you can organize your data in many ways. You can organize maybe color of the car, year of the car, model of the car. But each of those that I just explained, they are going to be really large containers. For example, you might have 20,000 red cars, but maybe 500,000 black cars. So it's not going to be balanced if you're going to go with the color. If you're going to go by year, it might be better, but maybe this year you're going to create 1 million cars and everybody's going to love it. Next year you might have a 5 million. So that's probably not a good option either. And it's going to be a big container. Uh, as I said before, Cosmos DB likes containers smaller. Uh, so what's going to happen here is it's much easier if you pick the win number of a car. So for each container, it's going to have one car. In. If you know the win number, you can go and find this container very easily on this physical partition. Open it. You can read data and write data about that car very easily and be done with it. So it's much easier to, I guess, organize it that way rather than try to organize it with larger containers because that's that's not going to work and it's, you're going to have a lot of uh, problems if you're going to have large containers and you're going to have a, put a lot of items in it. So that was for the car. So if I try to give you maybe one more example, let's say we are going to create a website just like Amazon, right? We want to sell stuff. So our data model is going to have users our users are going to have orders. Usually orders are going to have some reviews. Well, we need some shopping cart too. So this is really the minimum that we are going to have in our database. So all of those items are going to have a lot of IDs in them, right? So if you think, think about it, you know, you're going to have users, you're going to have a user ID, and you're going to have a probable location ID where this person is living. 
you're going to have orders. You will have order ID, product ID, brand is ordered, and you are going to have products, a bunch of IDs here. Now, if you were in a relational database, you are going to end up with many tables here, and you're going to join them depending what application page you are trying to render. But in our case, we kind of really need kind of know the application knows what to retrieve. We don't want to kind of go and join many tables. We can, it's not like you can anyway, I mean NoSQL. But if you think about the Amazon, so if you open the Amazon website first, well, if you are logged in, Amazon knows only who you are and maybe can suggest some stuff on the main page. Usually it just displays whatever it wants to sell. So first page is fine. But let's say you are trying to find a book, right? And you want to go with the products first. So first, you need to pick the product category for books to actually list the books, right? So for that, I will suggest you to have a product category container. And under that, just put really simple information, only what you need to display on the page. When you actually click the books category, what you're going to see is probably a picture, a small description, and price. Right, that, that's it. So you can have a container named product categories. You will have a product cat ID in it. That will be probably your uh, the partition key. And then you can have a name, price, and maybe a link to somewhere of the image of the book, right? So that will make it very easy because when user actually clicks the category, you know exactly the ID, you know where to go. Everything will be much faster and cheaper to get the data. Well, what's going to happen when they actually pick the book? If you don't have the category ID or your category ID is not going to be useful anymore because probably you're going to have the product ID. Then you will have a product table and it will have all the information about the product, including product ID, product category ID, that image that you just see, and the price. It's, that is totally fine in a NoSQL database. You don't kind of have to normalize everything like that in the uh, Cosmos TV because that actually helps you. Uh, so in that case, let's say you are looking at SQL Server uh, book, you click on it, your product ID is five. Then you're going to go to the products table. Your product ID is going to be your partition key. So you are going to get your data very easily and that product table is going to have everything you need to render that pitch. You are going to have the images. You are going to have the price. You are going to have the reviews. You are going to have everything. In it. So, as long as you know that product ID five, you are going to open that container, and everything you are going to need to render that page is going to be in that in that uh, container, uh, and it's going to be much easier and cheaper for you to retrieve that data for you. The only problem right now, probably you're going to say that, OK, we have the same data in two places, though. What's going to happen if the name of the product changes? Now I need to go two places and change it. You are correct, but there are actually features to handle that. So if that happens, for example, an update comes up and product name changes, you can use, for example, change feed uh, of Cosmos DB, and you can program that. And Cosmos DB can actually update multiple places if it needs to. It sounds more difficult, but if you go this way, it will be much cheaper for you. It will be much faster for you. And just that's one of the biggest difference between the relational and non-relational databases. Uh, when it comes to partition uh, key and partition ID, IoT devices can be a little bit different than regular uh, tables. For example, if you have a table named orders, you are going to have a lot of information about the order in it. So you have you know, many candidates to actually make the partition ID. In IoT devices, that can be challenged because usually IoT devices do not have that much information. All it's trying to do is, if it's, a, for example, sensor on your car, maybe it's just sensing the level of the oil. It all it's going to have and it's going to care is the maybe the level of the oil and maybe the temperature of the oil, maybe some kind of ID of the sensor ID, that's it. So you don't really have that much information and that much options to make, you know, partition key valuable here. So if you look at this one, uh, in older days, we have IoT devices too, as you can see. There's all kind of IoT devices out there. 
So if you are going to actually pick something, our data is really, we don't have that much. We know maybe the year because that was happening that day. And maybe the device ID, if you have a device ID, you are really lucky. And anyway, this might be the uh, the ID of the car. So if this is the only way, and if we are going to pick the you know year here, for example, well, it's going to be hot partition because this year we might have maybe 1,000 of this. Maybe next year we're going to have 10,000 of it. So picking year is not going to be good. And the other one is the device ID. And well, in our case, this might not be the uh, you know the right way to do. So we might what we might need to do is maybe we might need to combine this two, which should make it more unique. So in here, for example, I'm picking the device ID and year and creating a whole different property, which is more distinct than this two. Or what I can do here is the good one with the first one is I can recreate it. That means if I'm going to read the data back, I can recreate this partition key and my queries will be cheaper and faster because I know the partition key. But if I my application doesn't care about reading the data, it all cares about writing the data, I can make it even more distinct than that. What I can do here is I can use these two properties, combine them. At the end, maybe I can randomly pick a number from 0 to 250 or you know what, whatever. So this number will be a random number every time I try to write the data. That will create another partition every time I try to write the data, and that will make the writes very fast. But the problem with that is, as I said before, if you try to read this data, specifically this data, well, there's no way you're going to be able to kind of guess this because this number is always going to be random here. Uh, also, what else you can do? You can actually hash the device ID too, if you like. This you can uh, recreate this because you know both year and the device ID. So whenever you hash it, it's always going to be same. So you can go in all those ways when it comes to partitioning for IoT devices, and that can be challenged because the number of nodes, the properties, is not going to be limited in our IoT devices. So I think that's all I have for you today. I hope everybody learned something new today. And again, I can just uh, answer any of your questions now, or if you have any other questions later, you can follow me from any of those platforms and I will be happy to help. Thank you. Awesome, you are on time. It's seven o'clock dot. All right. So yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to mute, unmute yourself and you can ask any question that you might have. I don't see anything in the chat as well. Okay. If no questions, then on behalf of the user group, I would like to thank you, Hassan, for taking your time out and presenting on the topic today.